Hi, my name is Tim Garner and I'm a technical marketing engineer at INSBU. I'm going to talk to you about how Titration can uh, carve up the workloads in your data center uh, from a visibility perspective. So who do you give access to which parts of your data center and what actions can they perform on that? And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we can actually enforce these policies right down at the sensor level itself. So firstly, we need to look at the idea of scope. Scope really is trying to translate the organization of the customer down to the network itself and the workloads inside the network. Every single customer basically has a completely different organization structure. And Titration is very flexible when you define scopes. In fact, it reuses the filtering technology that we've previously discussed to help carve up that access. You can then give users access to different parts of the scope tree and give them different permitted actions on that part of the scope tree so that they can then, for example, just map the application or that they can go and enforce the policies of the application. And it really opens Titration as a platform for not just the core networking team and the security team, but actually right down to the application owners so they can really model and drive the policy of their own network. It actually makes the data center network become a lot more autonomous in that case because no longer are the application teams having to constantly send tickets back and forth to the network team or the security team to open up this port or to connect these two different services together. It helps them really move towards that model where the network administrators are just defining the shared services that people consume from. So how do we define a scope? Well, basically it's the same as the filters. You just give it a set of different attributes, and then Titration is dynamically calculating which workloads actually map into those filters or those scopes. So for example, an endpoint might change its job. It might have been a staging endpoint that you move to production, and then it will move from the staging scope to the production scope. And these scopes are constantly being reevaluated by Titration to make sure that what you are managing is up to date with the workloads in the data center. And you can see that we can scope based on the traditional network forwarding uh, pieces, but we can also use those annotations to generate the scopes as well. Just a couple of little points to mention is that a workload can be part of multiple scopes. It actually might sound a little bit confusing at first, but it really drives the flexibility and the power of the system because no longer do you have to say, well, you are doing this one role and you must follow this exact policy. That scope or that workload can be given different policies to, uh, and that can be driven by different users. It becomes very powerful. And we've discussed how it's continuously updated. So here's a couple of scopes that we've defined on this titration cluster here. So we start at the root level to say, well, anything that's inside VRF1 is part of my default scope. And then I have two or three subscopes. I have my CentOS scope where the host name has to be localhost. I can define a scope using addressing as well. So I can say, well, anything in that 172.20 slash 24 subnet except 163 is part of my infra. And I can say, well, these are my titration cluster collectors as well. And you can really divide it up like that, once again, using those filters. So you can go right down to one endpoint when you're deriving your scope. And you can nest multiple scopes lower and lower and lower. And you can give users privileges to see just one part of that scope. So if I see I have a lower privilege user here who I'm logged in, that is just access to that CentOS scope. If I select a scope, all I can see is the CentOS. And when I check the scopes tree, I can see that I only have read privileges on that particular section of the scope tree. And when I go to my flow search, I only retrieve flows related to that part of the scope tree. It becomes really, really powerful when you're trying to divide up your data center network and give access to different teams that work inside that data center. So now you have these scopes and you have the map of the application, at the end of the day, you really actually want to take some action with that level of insight. So what we can do is define policy in intent. So when we're talking about intent, we're saying, for example, well, I just want to stop anything that's non-production talking to production. I don't really want to tell you what subnets are production. I just want you to dynamically work out which IP addresses have that production tag. 
I might just want to say, well, only anything inside the HR scope tree can access the employee database, and no other application can ever access that employee database. So then when you kind of like up-level the description of policy in your data center, you can become much more flexible in what you can define, and it becomes um, a lot more powerful, actually, because no longer are you having to rely on net, uh, information that's encoded as it passes through the network. You can really just use these annotations and higher-level information to describe your policy. Now, how that is actually achieved is basically by leveraging that sensor that we have inside the OS, we can orchestrate the native firewall on that operating system. So on Linux, we're talking about IP tables, and on Windows, it's obviously the Windows firewall. So then wherever that endpoint ends up, whatever infrastructure that it's actually running on, the policy goes with the endpoint. You don't really have to worry about changing your ACLs so much right down to that granular micro-segmentation level. It happens at the endpoint itself. Now, you can obviously choose to either run the sensor in just monitoring mode, and zero uh, lines of code in that monitoring sensor will have enforcement uh, capabilities, or you can have the enforcement sensor. The reason being is that we get feedback from some customers that, well, hey, I don't even want, want to have the ability to enforce policy, so it really helps demark that line between monitoring and actually taking some action with your software sensor. Now, what it really is doing is dynamically working out where which endpoints sit inside those particular different groups and what firewall rules do I need to put on that host itself. And these will be updated uh, basically continuously in basically near real time. So as endpoints move from scope to scope or as they match different filters, the rules will be updated and re-pushed down to that sensor itself. So you are enforcing this on the sensor running in the host, for example. Uh, how do you get a, uh, around that stupid security argument that this is not secure because someone can become root on the host and turn off the sensor? So it's a good question. We have a couple of different, uh, let's say, protections against that. So if someone disables the sensor entirely when it has been enforcing, you get a big alert notice into Tration itself, and you can generate an event notification to go call someone and go chase them down. It also remediates the sensor policies as well. So if they don't remove the sensor, but they wipe the rules on IP tables, Titration is going to notice that in instantly and put those rules back in place. So there's two different safeguards against someone trying to circumvent your policy rules. I'm positive Felix Lindner will find a way around that, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Just a stupid thing. What if I change, I enter there, I change the IP tables, and I'm just going to, for example, let's say I'm going to just put the file in read-only or change the, the permissions in the file. Do you think it's able to catch that as well? Permissions of files on the disk? Uh, let's say uh, I have a, config, a configuration file, which I have modified and uh, maliciously, and I kind of edit the permissions on the file so that your product is not able to get there anymore. Is it something that you're able to catch up as well? So um, seeing as our product is root, uh, the sensor rule yeah. processing okay. privileges, it should be able to override anything okay, that you okay. do. It's running this root. Yeah. Okay. Just if you remember back to that slide of, uh, a while back, just the bit that orchestrates the firewalls can be done in the high privilege mode. OK. Yeah. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now there's, um, there's an interesting dynamic in the data center policy world as well, in that there's different teams that have uh, let's say, uh, overruling, say, uh, the final say at the end of the day. So InfoSec basically is the, the final uh, person that says, well, no matter what you want to do as the application owner, I don't ever want you to open port 22 to the outside world. So we order the application policy workspaces into Tration uh, from top to bottom, and then we discover if there's any conflicts or clashes, and we automatically resolve those conflicts based on the priority of the, uh, the workspace order. So InfoSec policies can go at the top. The application owner can even try and open port 22 to the outside world, but the InfoSec policies are always going to be uh, overriding that, that, um, that uh, application owner's do you report on those conflicts? Uh, we do have a level of reporting into the uh, UI as well. And then similarly, we also have the concept of shared services. So 
most data centers probably have AD and DNS and NTP shared uh, by, the, uh, by every single application. Or someone might open up a database that different applications connect into. So Titration allows you to offer a public service when you're an application owner. And then when other applications want to connect into that service, it generates a notification between those two application owners and says, well, hey, this WordPress application would like to connect into our um, AD uh, server, and would you like to accept that connection request? You can either do those manually, or the application dependency mapping algorithms will detect that it is trying to reach this service and generate that notification between the two. My final demonstration will be just to show you that we can take the policy that we've discovered between two different groups. So here, for example, we would like to enforce that my local host CentOS VM should be able to talk to my titration public cluster. We can enforce that policy, and we can monitor that policy as well. So if we start to see traffic that is stepping outside of the policy, you can watch that, and you can get alerts, and you can immediately remediate the, the um, the breaches or perhaps just the anomalous traffic. And then finally, you can monitor every single endpoint and see exactly what rules have been put in place on that endpoint. And you get very detailed monitoring from titration. OK, so sorry I was a bit rushed at the end there, but I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. Um, and uh, let's hope we speak to you soon.